We have a lot of things in our world that uh, says is how you can be happy. Sometimes we live in an unhappy world and we just might make little faces and that's about the best we can do because deep down we may not feel that happiness or we may be happy. Whatever makes you happy. That's what we want uh, people to think about during unhappy times. And there's just so many things that make people happy, worldly things. They can make people happy. You can look after this pandemic and you can see a lot of articles, uh, magazine articles, and how to make a happy home because you're in it all the time. Talking about your house. And that you probably need a lot more windows than that because you feel happier when you're looking out. It needs to be a flexible place because you begin to realize that you're there a lot and you may be doing things a lot. So they need to be flexible spaces. So wide spaces, they're just not going to be living room or bedroom and that sort of thing. You, you make it, might want to design that house to make it a happier place. You might want to have a perfect ventilation because that's, uh, you begin to realize I'm, it's kind of been stuffy being in the house. It's more that you feel relaxed. What makes you feel relaxed? That ought to be the type of house that you have. It, it might be just looking at pretty furniture. No, what makes me feel at home and being relaxed? Those are things that are, people are looking at. Maybe that would present happiness in my, my life. It may be having enough money to retire on so you can retire. A lot of people start looking at that. I want just enough money to live on and then I want to die. You know, I don't want to leave anything to my heirs. That would make some guys happy, make some people happy. So it can be something that is uh, general for a lot of people. But I thought we might look, not just looking at happiness of a Christian when we're going through persecution. We talk about rejoice always. I'm talking about happiness. That is what we see from God's word, not uh, how to redesign your house or redesign your life. But uh, what does God actually say that makes you happy? He's not commanding you to rejoice and be happy. We can talk about that because we're in, in difficult times. The Bible does that. But he says something, this, this is what happiness is. And we're living in a day where you can train your brain. You might be doing that during COVID, but you need to have a happy wall in your, in your life. It means you put together mentally all the times in which you were happy, maybe with your family, with your friends, and you just put that on your mental wall and you can be happy any time of the day that you want to. You just call those images up. Maybe it's when you're making an eagle on a par five hole. You remember that. Maybe you made a hole in one. Maybe that was a special vacation. Maybe that was a special moment. You see the smile on the faces of the people you love. You just hang that on your mental wall because happiness is whatever you want it to be that has brought you joy. God has set forth some things that we might not think about as being uh, something that will cause joy, but it is something that we can realize that in the long run, that's, that's where happiness is. And I'd like to share those with you this evening. Got about four of them. Happiness is filling your minds with God's wisdom. It's finding God's wisdom. Talk about our creator. You talk about a search for happiness in your life. To ever find your creator's wisdom, wouldn't that be something that would make you happy? God says so. In Proverbs the third chapter in verse 13, we read where that is something that brings happiness to people. For whom, for happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. It's not that you have knowledge and you may know a lot of things and you study and you know a lot of things. That's not what we're talking about. Ecclesiastes 1 to 18 says so that's a grievous thing. That much learning and much knowledge brings forth this great sorrow. At the end of the book, in the idea of writing the books, there's no end to that. And it is a grievous thing just to read books and to have knowledge. But to be able to put things together in that knowledge of how things really work in your life or in the world around us, that is something 
He says, happiness if you find wisdom. Verse 18, Jehovah by wisdom found, founded the earth. So what happens in verse 18? This wisdom that you gain from, here's your creator. She is a tree of life in them that lay hold on her, and happy is everyone that retaineth her. I want a happy wall. I want, I want pictures in my mind that make me happy. I tell you, I've visualized something. I've got the tree of life on my wall. Why not put it on yours? The tree of life, and I'm going to retain her. I can bring it up anytime I want to. That here God is giving me how world is going to work out, how I am going to be living in accordance with God's will, and at the end, how what eternal bliss that will be. To have the wisdom to know how to go through facets of your life and to do so, there's, that's a happy thing. That's a happy tree to hold to. Happy is everyone that retaineth her to retain that type of wisdom. So finding God's wisdom, if you can do that, God says, that's a happy. Happiness is gaining God's wisdom. How we put things together. And what we begin to realize, there's something out there that the devil would like to derail you. And that's the pleasures, the happiness that's connected with sin. Moses realized that the pleasures of sin is just for a season. He could have been high up in Pharaoh's family. He was in Pharaoh's family and, and, and all of the things that went with that with Egypt, but he looked upon, rather, I will suffer with the people of God, because he looked what was ahead, and he realized that sin is just for a season. He found God's wisdom. Yes, it brought persecution, but happiness is to be able to find that which is indeed beyond just short-lived, short-lived pleasure, but things for eternity. And so what we do, we find this in the book of God. I'll look at three things. I think young people need to pay attention to this as you're thinking about life at a young age. That in the book of Proverbs, it's there for young people to gain the wisdom that they haven't experienced yet. So in Proverbs 10 through 19, you've got people that are maybe your peers saying, we're going to out here and we're going for the thrill of killing. We're going to kill people and rob them. And we're all going to share in the, in the reward of, of robbing them of their money. That's what we see. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. They say, come let us wait for blood. Let's look privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as Sheol. Thank you. That's something that's kind of sensational. Let's swallow up alive. They're just going to kill them. But that moment they're alive, they're dead, and we're going to share and what we gain. We shall find all precious substance and it will fill our houses with spoil. What does God's wisdom say? Don't go with that crowd. Young people are, are, are peer pressure. Don't go with them because it leads to their destruction. Their feet run to do evil. They make haste to shed, shed blood. For in vain is the net spread inside of any bird. And these lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privily for their own lives. Notice, they are going to suffer the death. And that's what happens a lot with thieves. They get killed. And a lot of times the thieves don't share in the reward. And wisdom says, I look beyond that. That would be a quick buck. I'll make a quick dollar. But it's short-lived. And a lot of times it takes away that person's life. Proverbs 7 chapter deals with the sexual pleasure that a young man might have with a woman. And here in this context, her husband is away. And there is the enticement in this long chapter of Proverbs 7, which is 27 verses. She hits upon all of the facets of his senses, his sense of smell, his sense of sight, his sense of danger. The man's going to be gone for a long time. Even brought in a religious aspect that here we've got this sacrifice that we must eat tonight. That was part of the law. And yet she's wanting to do something with this young man that brings forth his destruction if he follows through with that. With her much spare speech in 21, verse 21, she 
causeth him to yield. With the flattering of her lips, she forceth him along, and he goeth her straightway as an ox goeth to the slaughter, or as one in fetters to the correction to the fool. It didn't make any difference. The fetters to the fool, he goes headlong anyway to his own destruction. Till an arrow strike through his liver as a bird hasteth to the snare and knoweth not that it is for his life. Now, you may have been able to tell him in certain terms that it's knowledge. Now, you got knowledge. But wisdom says that when that temptation comes, they can see beyond. They can see beyond that point that might give pleasure. And all the senses are fired up. And realize, I won't go that way. Because, see, he didn't know this for his destruction. Many young men have fallen into sexual immorality. A lot of people have fallen for making the quick buck. But what about drinking alcohol? In Proverbs, the 23rd chapter, verses 29 through 35, God tells you the end from the beginning. Just like in Proverbs 1, here's the end. I'm telling you at the beginning so you don't go that route. That's wisdom. I'm telling you the end from the beginning so you don't involve in the sexual immorality. I'm going to tell you the end from the beginning of what drinking alcohol will do. It will look good at the beginning. And it's something that goes down easy. It's beautiful to look at. But when you tarry long at the wine, this is what is going to happen. It goes down smoothly, sparkleth in the cup. That is, is that the pleasure you get? I just smell the wine. It smells good. And you start drinking and you give yourself the wine. At last it bites like a serpent. It stings like an adder. Your eyes behold strange things. Your heart, your heart shall utter perverse things. You, you talk out of your head. And yet you shall be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea. That would be a dangerous thing. Or as he that lieth up on the top of a mast. That would be a dangerous thing. And you will say, they have stricken me, shalt thou say, I was not hurt. I didn't feel a thing because you're so drunk. You don't feel a thing. That, we're looking at the end of the effects of drinking alcoholic beverages. And when shall I wake? I'll seek it yet again. That's not why. That's not wise. Just continue to think. Alcoholics do it all the time. Sorrowful for all that's causing it one moment and then they're back at it again. It becomes addictive. These are three things that young people experiment. Gang activity, making a quick buck by killing somebody. Fornication, especially with a married woman. Experience. That sexual pleasure, that woman wants me. And she lets him feel that way to satisfy her own pleasures. And then drinking alcoholic beverages. That's kind of an old book. It's the way we've always been when we're young. And Proverbs is helping us be wise. Happy is the person that sees beyond those things. and keeps their body pure. A lot of times avoids a lot of dangers by going along with the crowd. And doesn't ruin their life becoming addicted to substances, whether that is alcohol or, or food or pain, narcotics, and all of those things that we're, our lives are experiencing. We, we're aware of those things. They could become addictive. Wisdom of God brings forth some happiness that God says it's happy. Secondly, Happiness is when we bring ourselves under the control of God's Word. Now, there's a pride issue. And nobody's going to tell me what to do. Sometimes young people say that. Sometimes older people say that. But that's a pride issue. And to think that happiness is that I'm going to submit to someone or something else. And to bring myself under the control of somebody else. That's a step that people won't take, but God says you're happy when you do that. And a lot of times to be a slave to a man, to be a slave to alcohol, to be a slave to, to people, that would not be a happy thing. But we're talking about God and we're talking about his word. We're talking about his requirements. We're talking about his law. In Proverbs 29 and verse 18, notice how God speaks about this as being happy. Where there is no vision, the people cast off restraint. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. 
Now, there'll be people that will interpret that in our day, people that have no vision. If you don't have a vision for your life, you think it up, whatever you, uh, you need to vision something, you need to set your goal. And if you don't have a vision, then you're not being following the wisdom of God. This is not talking about what you see and you plan and, and I'm going to be this and that when I'm going to be a certain age. I have a vision. That's not what happiness is. Here he's looking at the vision that God gives in his word through his word. The prophets have a vision from God. And that's what he's speaking about when he, when he says in verse 8, where there is no vision, there's no message from God, the people cast off restraint. I don't, I'm not going to be restrained by anybody. And if I'm not listening to God, I'm not going to be restrained by him. That's not wise. That's not a happy move in the end. And so we're bringing ourselves under the control of God because God has a law. And we submit to that. You know what our law is in First New Testament? First Corinthians 9, 21? Under law to Christ. Paul says, here the, the Jews had a law, but I'm appealing also to those who are not under the law of Moses, but we're under law. And he says, it's the, under the law of Christ. I'm going to rest be restrained by some words in a book. A lot of people say, that's not happy. Sound like I'm a slave. And the Bible will speak about us being bond servants to Christ. That's just something you're going to have to decide for yourself. Young people, older people as well. But that is the road to happiness. Because God is our creator. And here's the restraint he's placing upon us for our good. For our eternal good. Because he's going to deal with sin. And our everlasting good, our happiness, is well, well I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow God's law. I'm going to let it teach me. It's like a tree of life. It's going to help me in my young age to, to withstand pressures from the, my peers that make it bad mistakes. But I'm going to submit to that. And what a journey that can be for you. Because what you're doing, you're giving heed to God's word because you trust him. You trust him. Proverbs 16 and verse 20. Those things go together. He that giveth heed unto the word shall find good. God's word will bring good to your life when you follow its principles. And whoso trusts in Jehovah, happy is he. Happiness is trusting in Jehovah to the point that you will follow his word. And you will submit to his word. And wherever it takes you, you go. And you'll be following the way of wisdom. But it's also a way of happiness. Because see, sometimes what we want to do becomes a stumbling block to others. It's not a matter of just, well, I've got knowledge and I know the truth, but I'm going to do what I want to do and not have any regard for anyone else. That's not wise, and that's not the road to happiness. See, the road to happiness is submitting not only to God, but I'm submitting to the well-being of others, the spiritual well-being. Look at Romans 14, and verse 22 says, The faith which thou hast, have thou to thyself before God. So I believe, let's say in this context, that meats are clean. And by the way, they are before God. I believe that, God believes that. But that's not, when you bring yourself under the law of God, there's somebody else to think about. What about the person who still thinks it's wrong? That would be the Jew who had a dietary restrictions. Even though it's that way. It says, happy is he that judgeth not himself in that which he approveth. What is he doing? You approve, and it's true, that meats are clean. And you can eat all of the meats that a Jew couldn't eat under the old law. And far as God is concerned, that, that, is, that is lawful to do now. But as people were coming to the faith from Judaism, their practice had been that all their lives. And to have that change, 
Some of them work there. I don't care. I'm just going to live a life of a Christian. I have a right to do it. When you submit to God's law, you're going to submit to others. And the fact that they don't know as much as you. And they haven't been able to cross that line that all meats are clean. I know they are. But for me to do that, it still violates their conscience. And what you do, you don't want to be condemned or judged by that which you approve. That doesn't look good on you. You prove what's right, but you're condemned for your actions. And so we see in verse 16, let not then your good be evil spoken of. Don't let the truth that you have be overshadowed because you became a stumbling block to another and caused them to sin when they violated their conscience. That's just an example following the teachings of God that God here placed as Jews and Gentiles were coming together in the faith of how they could protect the conscience of another and to have unity. That's God's wisdom. And here was the people, I, I, won't, I won't condemn myself because I don't want to be a stumbling block. So you're going to submit not only to God's law, but even when God's law is right, you're going to submit to those to bring them along. Because that's the life of, of a Christian. Thirdly, happiness is a godly home. That's where happiness is. And what is interesting in Ephesians 5, 22 through 6, 4, is that here are the relationships between the husband and the wife, the wife and the husband first, and the husband and the wife. Get into chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. There's the children. And what it's centered upon is God. It's centered upon Jesus Christ. Wife submits as to her husband as unto the Lord. The husband loves his wife as Christ loved the church. Here's your example of Christ. Children are to obey their parents in the Lord for it because it's right. Here are godly principles. Before you get to any details of how you're going to raise your children, how you're going to live your life with your husband and wife, by the way, a particular paper I read was that after 10 years, only 25% of marriages are considered happy like they should be. After 10 years, what's your marriage like after 10 years? Are you happy? A lot of times it's not. Only 25% sometimes say it's happy after 10 years. That kind of amazes me. But I think God's people ought to be able to do that. Because we're centering it upon the Lord and not ourselves, not our happiness, not our easy way of, of give, doing things, but upon godliness. That's what I mean by godliness. And we do that. And we begin to realize, well, that's the basis of it. And the God's word fills out all this. We're going to be blessed with children. Happy should we be because we have children. Look at turn with me to Psalm 127. It's an interesting uh, psalm. And it says, build your family upon God. You want him to be there as, as, as the center. Because listen to this, except Jehovah build the house. They labor vain that build it. Are you going to build it upon God's principles? Well, you have a house, and you'll build it in vain because there's, some, there's great happiness that comes from that home. There's great blessings because we're dealing with people's souls, with our children, and with our husband and wife relationship. A lot of things are involved, but you build it there. Except Jehovah keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. If God's going to take the city, you watch all day long, he'll take the city. It is vain for you to rise up early. Here's your workaholic. Rise up early, take a rest late, to eat the bread of toil. I'm going to work, work, work. I'm going to get ahead. It's vain. But you can't sleep. You're worried about things. For so he giveth unto his beloved sleep. We do what we can. We realize God's in control and we're still following his principles. He's building our house. We're going to build our family around him. We've got 
Ephesians 5 doing that, just like we see here. Low children are a heritage of Jehovah. It's what Jehovah blesses us with as an inheritance. And the fruit of the womb is his reward. It's not your booby prize. It's not, well, well, you got third place. It's his reward. They are wonderful. In fact, he says, as arrows in the hand of a mighty man. You're looking at a, a, a soldier, a mighty man. He's approaching walls. You're thinking about battle. And he says, as arrows in the hand of a mighty man, so are the children of youth. All those babies. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. He didn't tell you how many. But the idea, the abundance, because why? They shall not be put to shame. Their abundance, and they are there to defend your name, father and mother, in the state of a man. They shall not be put to shame when they speak with their enemies in the gate. Now, that's figurative language. They'll never be put to shame. Their amount in this context will be something that no enemy wants to take hold of. And we begin to realize that here is God's blessing. He, this is a heritage. Anything you inherit is a heritage that's probably going to bring you happiness. And that's the, the joy that we see there. And what happens, fathers, when you discipline your children? In Proverbs, the 29th chapter, in verse 17, it gives you rest. It gives you rest. And there's joy in that. Verse 17, correct thy son and he will give thee rest. Yea, he will give delight unto thy soul. And when we look at those things, we say, that's what God says do. So what do you do? You begin your family on that. That's what we do. Now, there's some of us, we've already raised our families. Unless they circle back in again. But we've done that. We've made our mistakes, we've had our moments, and we have our joy, and, and if they bring the grandkids, fine. But we've had that strict connection with them. And we began to realize, well, what happens when I've failed? What happens when my children have gone astray? Proverbs 22, 6 says, you train up in the way that they should go, and even when they are old, they will not depart from it. Well, they've departed. Are you happy? Things like that can make us sad, but I want us to understand something. Life is not over just because our children leave the home. Life is not over yet. There's some teachings that was done. I want you to put yourself in a position that if you did not discipline your son, and you went through those early days, I don't think you would have a day of, of rest <laughs> with them just doing what those kids want to do. But you did that. You did it as a godly father. You said, I am going to let God build my house. And you went through every step of the way to do that. And sometimes it doesn't work perfectly for us. Sometimes I don't have a lot of good memories on my, my, my happy wall with family. And what we need to look at, life's not over yet, but what did you do that you ought to be happy about? I gave them the wisdom of God that will save their souls for eternity. I gave them the wisdom of God that told them the end from the beginning. I already know how it's going to end. I shared that with them. I taught that with them. I mirrored that in my life. They saw that example. Now they may turn. Jesus says that you will be brought up and turned toward the authorities in those days of persecution. And your own family members will deliver you up to be put to death. They despise you. So be it. I thought this sermon was to be happy. There's a happiness that they know the truth. They know what a godly home can be like. 
where people respect the other people in the family. They recognize their role. They've seen the discipline. And you live long enough to realize that was a good thing. Thank you, Mom. Thank you, Dad. And what ought to make you happy is that if I had not done that, I had never disciplined much. I'm never going to build my family on Ephesians 5 through 6. I'm not going to just care about the children, just get them out of the house and we'll do the best we can. And I'll, they'll just kind of go a worldly way. What would they have to come back to when they get old? And you can be dead and gone and you will still speak. That will make you happy. I don't have to go back and retrain them. They know. And you have done the best any parent could ever do when you build your home on God. Let him build the house. And he knows from the point of eternity what's best. And sometimes we think, well, they're not going that way. They're not going that way right now. But they know. And you've got to give God's wisdom and what you've done, you entrench that into their heart to realize that may come to the front when they realize they haven't got this world figured out like they thought they did and realize that, you know, godliness is the way of happiness. World will never give you credit for that. But you were wise to go that route. And that's where we find happiness in the home. And finally, Happiness is being corrected by the Lord. I mean, have you ever thought about that? But Job 5 in verse 17 says to see what, what a, a blessing this is. And it may be for different reasons, but it says, But happy is the man whom God corrects. Therefore despise not thou the chastening, and he uses this word, of the Almighty. God is one thing. Almighty. I don't like that blows of chastening from the Almighty. That hurts. That's painful. Have is a man that God corrects. I've realized that. But here's the chastening that comes from God Almighty. There's nobody more mightier than all. He's almighty. And what happens in the Bible is that if you realize that you're in the hands of God Almighty, you're happy He just corrected you instead of destroyed you. And you're getting the correction from a loving God. He's almighty, but He didn't destroy you. He just corrected you. Thank you, God. And I'm ready to listen to your chastening and thankful that you're so merciful to me, a sinner. In Proverbs 3, verses 11 and 12, we see the idea of being corrected. My son, despise not the chastening of Jehovah, not the chastening of your daddy, the chastening of Jehovah, Neither be weary of his reproof. For whom Jehovah loveth, he reproveth, even as a father, the son in whom he delighteth. He's there to correct you as a loving father, not an almighty destroying God, which he is. And he takes these matters and he corrects us. And we need to be looking at the chastening of the Lord. We may be going through chastening of the Lord in our society. It may do happening in your life. It's a time to reflect. It's a time to turn and to turn back to God. Because what happened, he's, he's correcting us for our own well-being. We're going the wrong way. And so he's bringing us back. Let's come back to the basics. Let's come back to what God would have us to do. Let's keep building the way we should. 
And there's going to have to be a change in my life. There's going to have to be a change in my mind. We call that repentance. In 2 Corinthians, the 7th chapter, verses 9 through 10, the Apostle Paul makes a distinction between worldly sorrow and we have worldly sorrow and, and we, don't, we, we may have a, a sorrow there, but it's not godly sorrow. And he makes this point about it. Kind of when we get caught, we're sorrowful. But that doesn't change things a lot of times. We'll just keep doing the same thing. I now rejoice. Paul rejoices. Not that you were made sorry, but that you were made sorry, sorry unto repentance. And that's the happy part. For you were made sorrow, sorry after a godly sort that you might suffer loss by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation, a repentance which bringeth no regret. Seems like I'm getting happy after I had godly sorrow. But sorrow of the world works death. I'm not happy. Godly sorrow. Is I'm sorrowful for what I've done before you, O oh God. I'm being corrected by you, O oh God. Your word has convicted me. And I'm going to change. Repentance, the word means the change of mind that's going to be reflected in your change of life. That's repentance. He's not saying I'm sorry and I'm not sorry, God. I'm sorry I'm going to change my life. And you will never regret that. Why are you not happy? Sometimes it's because we have regrets. We all do. Wish I could change that. Wish I could do that over again. No do-overs. Time rolls on. But we can learn lessons and realize that when I need to be corrected by God, it's out of His love. And when I suffer those consequences of making wrong decisions, I realize I'm the fault. We can change, especially if we've done wrong. We need to change that because it brings forth something that we'll never regret. It's always done for the better. So tonight, draw your little happy face. But I hope you put something into your life that really reflects happiness, that you just don't have to draw it on your wall or in your text messages. I'm happy. But happiness is, is what we've seen this evening, is that we're finding God's wisdom. He knows that beginning, he knows the end from the beginning. You cannot do any better than the Creator's wisdom, who brought all the things together. You're finding that in how you live a life upon earth as we live under the sun. You bring yourself under control of God's Word. That may be a big step for you because we have, all of us have pride. But no, we make that step. God, what's your Word say? I want to follow that. I'm going to build upon that and realize that what you'll do, you'll become a blessing to others because you don't want to be a stumbling block to them. And you'll think about others as you think about the things you reprove, that you approve of. You're building a godly home and you can start on that tomorrow. You can rebuild it again. You can start doing things the correct way of, of, of God that he becomes the center of how we live and how we deal with our children, how we deal with our husbands and wives. And maybe you've been doing that. Don't second guess yourself. Because see what you have done. You've laid a foundation that will be with that child forever. And they understand that. They know that. They know where to come back to. But in the meantime, you want to show this home will be happy because we're godly. We're doing right before God. It's the best that any person could ever do in a family relationship. Man's wisdom always cuts things short. Man's wisdom it doesn't see far enough into the future. Man's wisdom is limited because he's man. And our desires and our wishes, the wish I wish, I wish, I wish the way it were, sometimes that's selfish. But you'll never regret letting God build your house Enjoy the children when you have them. Raise them, discipline them. Let them see what it's like to be a Christian. And to mirror that in the way that God would have us to do that. And then change our mind for a better life. 
Because repentance from a godly sorrow always works for a better life. It always does. We become better. And when we become better, I think we become happier. And these are the things that God gives us. No, you're not going to find that in a magazine article on how to build a happy home. They'll tell you what colors to paint your house. They'll tell you how you ought to arrange your rooms. They'll tell you a lot of things about that. And you won't find that in financial things. Well, this is how you could be happy, how you can have a nest egg and how you can control that. And you'll be happy and you'll have enough money to live on. You'll never outlive your money. Here are the steps you take. You'll be happy. You'll be happy because I can teach you how to secure your home. And to be happy to realize nobody can take that home from me. No, we could, we could follow that. All sorts of articles about things like that. But only God's book gives you this. And to build your life on that, you'll never regret that. We have enemies. The world despises that. We're now trying to get children to be growing up and not to say mom or dad. They're going to be folks. That's what's being taught in our society. And when they get sick of that, when they realize that we didn't stop talking about mother and father, mom and dad, and children, and home, and relationships, and you will never find a better plan than Ephesians 5.22 through chapter 6 and verse 4 in the book of Proverbs. Parents, you have nothing better. Why not say, we're going to mirror that in our home. We're going to build on that in our home. And don't look back. Because you're looking forward. And what God would have us do, you're doing that. So I want to encourage you as parents and grandparents, as individual Christians going through difficult times, that these are the things that God says, happiness is this. It didn't say, now you need to rejoice. Happiness is this. When you have those characteristics in your home and your life. And I hope that we will always do that. Tonight, if you're not a child of God, you're not a member of the Lord's church, you're outside of his body. God adds to his body the saved. So that means you're not saved. Church doesn't save you, Christ does. Sing me a song about Jesus. So I'll tell you what the great song about Jesus is, that he died for your sins, he's raised for your justification. And through him, through the shedding of his blood and his resurrection, he, gave, he has the authority to save you. Will you submit to him? Because see, the life of happiness is all about submission to him. If you'll do that, let him save you from your sins. You'll never regret that because you're ready for anything that comes. You're ready for eternity. You're ready for the judgment. And you start living your life according to the word of God to please God. You'll never regret that. If we can assist you to start that journey, come as we stand, as we sing.